it's um, again, I cannot emphasize enough that uh, it's so much better to get on the PowerPoint presentation so you can see the panels than I prepare. It makes a lot more sense that way. Uh, you can do it on your smartphone. You just need to get PowerPoint on the smartphone. You just go to the app store and you can do it. And then it's just good to have. Then you can just uh, take a look at it on the phone. And uh, I'm going to, I haven't tested that myself, but I have been told it can happen. Uh, I think I will test it at some point just to make sure uh, that I'm absolutely correct. Praise God. Well, let me go ahead and open the document tonight. All right. And uh, I've talked about this before, but I've uh, gone a little bit more in depth with it this time. And uh, so I just have to get my, uh, my ducks all lined up and get this thing going. Quack, quack. And here we go. So we're going to talk about priorities tonight. Priorities. And, uh, well, uh, with priorities, we have to look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 14. In Deuteronomy 6, 14, the Lord says, You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. Uh, God warned Israel that when they went into the land, it would be very important for them not to follow after the false gods of the land, but to stay fast in worshiping the one true and living God, the one who brought them out of Egypt. And that the command is no less um, enforced then as it is today. Uh, we still believe today that we need to have our priorities set straight. God needs to be at the top of the list. Amen. Well, let's talk about a man named Micah, and let's see Micah. His priorities were off. Uh, this is a biblical Micah, not the Micah we know. We know the Micah we know has his priorities straight. Uh, but in Judges chapter 17 and verses 1 to 4, if you want to turn there, uh, Judges chapter 17, verses 1 to 4, the Bible says there was a man of the hill country of, of Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, the 1,100 pieces of silver, that were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse, and also spake in my ears, Behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be my son by the Lord. And he restored the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother. And his mother said, I dedicate the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son to make a carved image and a metal image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you. So when he restored the money to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of silver and gave it to the silversmith who made it into a carved image and a metal image, and it was in the house of Micah. Okay, so this is a, an interesting story because uh, somehow 1,100 pieces of silver were taken from Micah's family, uh, but Micah got it back. And when Micah got it back, he gave it to his mother, and his mother said, Blessed be my son by Yahweh. I mean, this is what she said. She uttered the name of Yahweh, because again, capital L-O-R-D in the Bible, in the Old Testament, means Yahweh. Yahweh was there originally. And then, so he restored the silver to his mother, and then his mother said, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give the silver to, uh, to be made into a carved image and a metal image, uh, and he's going to put the image in his house. And of course, the Lord was not for making images and bowing down to them. So Micah's priorities were off. Uh, you know, if his priorities were on straight, he should have said, Mom, hold on now. You know, we just been blessed by getting back the silver that was ours. So the last thing we want to do is tick off God. <laughs> we don't want to get him angry with us. So let's use that silver for something else. And, of course, it's also important because silver in the Old Testament is really a, a symbol of the atonement. So when you attribute atonement to a false idol, it's kind of a double sin. So Micah's priorities were off. And when we don't live up to priorities, well, certain things go wrong. And, and really, Micah would never have allowed this to happen had his priorities been straight. OK, um, Micah determined to put another God in his house. He's violating the first commandment. So, you know, he, his priorities were not the worship of God. Indeed, in Judges 17 
and verse 6, the Bible says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everybody did was right what was right in his own eyes. That sounds a whole lot familiar to what we see today. Judges chapter 17 and verse 6, you know, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everybody did what was right in his own eyes. Uh, no king. It was just symbolic that there was no leadership, no spiritual leadership. Uh, they were without it. And I remind you again that silver is the metal symbolizing atonement. So that was uh, a misplaced priority on Micah's part. And what Micah did was an abomination. He had to know it was an abomination. Um, you know, should have said, Mom, don't do this. Don't do this. Not a good, not a good deal here. And it's interesting that Micah's name means who is like God. Micah did not live up even to his name because his priorities were skewed. You know, who is like God? That was what his name means. Who is like God? And how ironic that he made an image like God when his own name begged the question. It was a, it's a rhetorical question. We know the answer to it already. There's none like God. But then Micah goes ahead and creates a false god in his own house. He, he allows that to happen. So you see, when his priorities got so messed up, he got his eyes off of what he was supposed to do. Uh, he basically really made his mother's wishes his priority. And you can see he himself hadn't lived up to his own priorities. Well, he lived up to his priorities. Let me rephrase that. But his priorities were off base. They were wrong, right? Micah invites a corrupt Levite into his house as well to be priest over his phony religion. He goes even further. You know, he's not just satisfied to make the idol. He goes, well, now I'm going to get myself a phony priest. So if we look at further into Judges chapter 17 and verses 7 to 13, Judges chapter 17, verses 7 to 13, it says, Now there was a young man of Bethlehem and Judah and the family of Judah. Now Judah means praiser of God, right? Who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And the man departed from the town of Bethlehem in Judah to sojourn where he could find a place. And as he journeyed, he came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah. And Micah said to him, where do you come from? And he said to him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm going to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said to him, stay with me and be to me a father and a priest, and I will give you 10 pieces of silver a year and a suit of clothes in your living and the Levite went in, and the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became to him like one of his sons. And Micah ordained the Levite, and the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, Now I know that the Lord Yahweh will prosper me because I have a Levite as a priest. Uh, you know, everything he's doing is wrong. You know, what business did he have to ordain a priest? That's not his business. It's not his business to ordain a priest, and he had the priest in his house and paid him to live there. And, of course, the priest is going, hey, this is a good arrangement, right? The priest should have been in Jerusalem, right? Should have been in Jerusalem and, and ministering in the, in the temple. At that time, that was where priests were supposed to be. But here this priest, you know, he's doubly wicked, and he determines he's just going to let Micah go by his thing because it was a comfortable living. So we see even... If Micah's priority was wrong, the priest's priority was wrong too. His priority was to fill his belly and to have a decent place to live, not to do the work of the Lord, right? Because he kind of fooled himself. And this is the thing, when we skew our priorities, sometimes we can think that what we're doing is, is ordained of God, you know, because we put it in a God context. Well, you know, I'm doing this, so God's got to be behind it. How do you know, right? And, and we try to fit God into our lives instead of fitting our lives into God. And this is exactly what Micah was doing. He was trying to fit God into his life, and so was the Levite, to fit God into his life rather than to fit his life into God. And uh, that's the whole thing with, with messed up priorities. We end up wanting to justify and okay the things that we want to do rather than the things that we need to do, right? Because it's, it's you know, when you live for God, you know, there's always a fear. The devil puts a fear in us. You know, so if I give up completely to God, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. And, you know, I don't want to end up being sent to as a missionary to the four corners of the earth, you know. 
Uh, but, you know, if we put ourselves in the hands of God, we know that every step that we take will be ordered of him, and it will be a blessed. And we'll look back and say, you know what? There was a way that I wanted to go, and there was things I wanted to do, but I followed after God, and God has blessed me. Because when we make God our number one priority, things will always work out. So what we place as number one in our lives will shape everything that follows on our priority list. The number one thing in our life will shape everything that follows, right? It becomes the top of the pyramid, and that's the thing that we will that we will put as number one. All right. If I make my family my priority, right, everything I do will revolve around family to the exclusion of all else. Jesus had something to say about family. He said in Luke chapter eight, verses nineteen to twenty-one, it said, "Then his mother and his brothers came to him to Jesus." But they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, your mothers and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. That's a lesson in priority because, um, you know, family, if family's at the top of the list, um, you know, wasn't, uh, wasn't Micah's mother at the top of his list? family was at the top of his list and what happened to him you know now i'm not saying family should not be really important they should be very high on your list they should be really really high but they can't be number one uh, because family you know they can cause trouble they can draw us away from god they can draw us into false religion which is exactly what happened to micah you know his mother really drew him into false religion i mean here she is and she's she she dropped the name of yahweh but she was not serving yahweh she was serving her own flesh her own belly so we have to be we have to ensure and, and just a little example um for vivid memory of uh, being in uh, silver spring and visiting uh, uh the kids grandparents and uh the kids grandparents uh, their sister and brother were all there with their spouses on Sunday morning. And Grammy and Poppy uh, turned and said to them, well, we're going to church this morning. You are welcome to come with us. Uh, but uh, we are, uh, we're going to be leaving. We'll be back at this particular time. And uh, if you don't want to come with us, you can stay here. And they made sure to let that, let them know they were going to go to church to serve God. That was the number one thing for them. Uh, very impressive, you know, um, so it made a statement that way. Indeed, family needs to be at the top of the prior list, but not number one. Can't be number one. Others have work or career as their priority. You know, God will go down the list to number three between, behind work and family. You know, that's not a good place for God, work and family. You know, I mean, hey, I, mean, I, I get people wanting to do that, but, and you know, if family comes after work, uh, you know, family's going to suffer. You work for your family to take care of your family, right? Your family doesn't just support you so you can work. Uh, so it's a very important, you know, when some people, and uh, unfortunately in our modern world, women have been forced to, uh, to, to search for careers at the, at the expense of family. And it's like, what happens is your kids get raised by somebody else. You know, um, it's a sacrifice. I remember when my kids were born I, and their mother stayed at home, we couldn't get a big house. We had to settle for something smaller, but we had, we were in a good neighborhood and uh, we had a roof over our head, clothes on our back, food in our bellies, church to go to, but wanted to make sure that when they came home from school, mom was going to be there and uh, to ask them how their day was and that, that security was there for them all the time. Amen. So I didn't want to put work before family. Um, putting what we do for a living first will affect all that follows after. It will affect all that follows after. Amen. In Luke chapter 12 and verses 15 to 21, Jesus said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there will store all my grains and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods and laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. 
and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up his treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. And, and this just piggybacks on the Micah story, right? Because uh, Micah put his comfort first, you know, to the point where Micah said, well, I'll bring a priest into my home to bless this false religion. Uh, it was easy. It was convenient for Micah and his mother, and it was convenient for the priest as well. But uh, it certainly wasn't uh, wasn't a, a good uh, list of priorities to do that. And Jesus uh, is one saying that, look, I mean, our priority can be the comfort of the world, and those things are good. But, you know, when our soul is required of us, you know, we have nothing left, and you know, that's it. We go without it. We go without anything. It goes behind. It becomes somebody else's, all of the things that we built. So putting God first is the way to blessing for all that follows. Putting God first is the way to blessing for all that follows. You know, because you know what? God is not going to destroy your family. And let me make this clear before we step into this uh, section of the teaching. You know, cults have a way of tainting your family as evil, right? Uh, don't don't mess with your family. That's what they were famous for doing. They take usually young people away from their parents and their family and say that their family is Satan, stay away from them. And um, I remember there was um, somebody who said that, uh, that a pastor had told this person not to go to a family barbecue, you know, that everybody there was evil. And I thought to myself, I said, I said to the person, I said, well, what do they, what do they, how do they expect these, your, your family to get the word of God if you're not there? You need to show up and, and spread the gospel. You might win a couple of family members. You know, now family can drag us down. You know, we don't want family to lead us down like it has happened with Micah and his mother. But, you know, God will always bless the family, and we need to pray that our family come to him and continue to love them uh, and continue to reach out to them if it's, if it's at all possible. Uh, because, you know, once that's, that's a negative thing. This, these kind of scriptures have been used to uh, become abusive to people and uh, for, for churches to behave like cults. I mean, I would, I don't know your whole family, but I would sure wish that every one of you listening, that everybody in your family would come to church. We'd fill the building. We'd have a whole lot of fun, you know, but how are they going to come to church if you don't preach. The Bible says that in the book of Romans. How shall they hear unless they, uh, someone is sent? And how shall it be sent? You know, <laughs> blessed are feet that bring the gospel, uh, bring glad tidings of good things. You know, that, that God sends us into the world to preach to the world. Amen. So, you know, but family can be an disruption. But Proverbs 3, 5 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. And that's, you know, we, we sort of gloss over the scripture a lot, but it's really important because the proverb is telling, trust the Lord with all your heart. Put, put God on the top of your priority list. Don't lean on what you want and you know. Don't do what Micah did and say, well, I can, you know, have this idol and bring this priest in and everything will be okay. You know, do whatever God and go in whatever direction God wants you to go in because he will make straight your paths. You know, and what does that mean? It means that that you'll you'll be very assured that you're going in the right direction, and you'll be happy with that. I've told uh, people who are looking for jobs. I said, you know, what I did, uh, what worked for me is I would say, Lord, open the door. I'd look for jobs. You know, my my first pastor. Uh, you know, I was um, I had um, you know gotten married, and I was working kind of a low level job. And my pastor came and said, he said, Brother Jim, need a job. And every time I saw him, he would say, Brother Jim, you need a job. And I got so sick of hearing that. So what I did was I just got a newspaper and started applying for jobs everywhere. And then God finally got me a job. And I went to the pastor's, hey, pastor, I got a job. He said, praise God. <laughs> but I had prayed that prayer, said, Lord, close the doors that need to close. And open the one that needs to open, because that's the path that I know is going to be straight. And it's going to be a blessing, and God made sure that that happened because, you know, if you go into a job because you, you know, you want the job really bad, you know, this is going to be, the, you think it's going to be the right thing for you, it might be, a, it might mess you up. You know, now I've said this before, if you haven't heard, if you've heard this testimony before, forgive me, many of you have, 
you know, but I remember when I was working uh, and uh, a job offer came up to me that was going to pay me twice of what I was making. It was a significant amount of money back in the day. And we're talking six figures. And um, I really wanted that job. I was down to three people. I thought, oh, this, I'm the best guy for this position. I really want this, Lord. And, uh, well, I did get it. I was like, oh, man, I didn't get the job. That, that, oh, I'm, I'm bummed about that. So I had to go back to the other job I didn't like so much. I'm very unhappy there. But uh, as I told in the testimony, three months after this guy had been hired for this job, they got rid of the job. So I would have worked for three months and then been out there without a gig, you know. Uh, so God protected me because I put Jesus first and said, Lord, you know, if this job is not for me, shut the door. And then God shut the door. And I thought, oh, why did I even pray that prayer? But three, three months later, the Lord showed me that it was a good prayer. <laughs> Amen. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 to 34, Jesus says, Therefore be not anxious, as saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need all of them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Uh, you know, this this scripture comes, you know, Sermon on the Mount, and after Jesus is talking about how, you know, God, around this, uh, and around this scripture, how God takes care of the sparrows, you know, and the, he puts beautiful clothing on the lilies of the field. Uh, just a little personal note, um, uh, we, um, we used to put a bird feeder in a backyard um, until a bear came and three times and tried to get it. <laughs> So can't put the bird seed in the bird feet seed anymore. So we just take bird seed and throw it out on the back, in the back patio, you know, and the birds come around. And uh, my wife was telling me those birds were, you know, would come to the window and stare at her and say, okay, where's our food? You know, I, and I, I said, okay, that's cute. I don't, I doubt the birds are doing that, but boy, in the bird, <laughs> I, I was there in the kitchen and look at the window and there's a bird sitting there looking at me. It's like, okay, dude, where's the food? <laughs> So I felt like, gee, God is using me to feed these little birds. <laughs> and they really, and they're really aggressive, you know, they said, Hey, you know, come on, come on, waiter, bring the meal. <laughs> so, amen. You know, but God promises he'll take care of us. Like he takes care of the birds, you know, and, and he will provide the seed for us. If we seek his kingdom and put him number one, everything else will follow suit. Praise God. Now, let me take a, a little, uh, deep dive into some theological teaching here. We're going to talk about ethics because your ethical system and my ethical system will be, will determine our priorities and how we deal with things. All right. Now the principal ethic that's, there's an ethic called the principal ethic and ethic basically is a system of morality An ethic is a system of morality. So we have a principal ethic. Well, you, fo you follow a principle such as I'll have no other gods before my God. The Ten Commandments are principal ethics, right? You follow a principle, and you will not break that principle, okay? Um, everything you do will be measured against that principle. So thou shalt not steal, right? So, well, you know, these pens at work, they're really nice, and, you know, I'm going to take a few of these home. Well, you know, if, if they didn't, haven't told you, hey, whatever you want to take, if you want to take pens home, go for it. You know, then, you know, your, your principle will determine that you won't steal. And again, the Ten Commandments are principles that we follow, right? The first four relate to God, and the last six relate to people, how we deal with people. Love your father and mother, right? Honor your father and mother, uh, don't murder, don't steal, don't covet, right? Uh, 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 don't lie. All these things follow from the principle, right? So that's a pretty good ethic, and that's why the, the Ten Commandments are those principles that we follow. Well, there's a utilitarian ethic. Now, you know, the utilitarian ethic is basically this, the ethical system. It's based on the notion of the greater good, right? Like utility, whatever, you know, use something's useful. Um, one merely has to identify what his greater good is, okay? So whatever he does to make that greater good happen is acceptable in this system. Amen. Uh, basically, the utilitarian ethic is known by this phrase, the end justifies the means, 
the end justifies the means, right? Now, the problem with following this system is that you can justify any evil under the sun in order to get what you want. Okay, now the utilitarian ethic, it can be useful in the church. I mean, if there's a greater good, um, you know, if, um, uh, you know, if I could go back in time and, uh, and do away with Adolf Hitler and prevent the uh, slaughter of 11 million people, well, you know, that's greater good. Saving, killing one for, to save 11 million is a pretty good trade-off. And that is essentially the kind of thing that you, utilitarian ethic um, teaches. But, you know, you could, whatever you design is your greater good, you know, you say, well, if I just... Uh, you know, steal all this money and take these cars. And, and then once I have all this money, I'll distribute it to people, you know, in the church. Uh, yeah, but you've, you've robbed and you've stolen. Um, and you think the greater good was providing for people in the church, but what you did to get there, you know, no, 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 no. You violated lots of principles, right? So the utilitarian ethic, ethic needs to be used, used sparingly and only in very cases where you can definitely identify the greater good and God is behind it, right? So, you know, because you can justify any kind of evil if you think it brings the greater good. It's a very dangerous ethical system to follow, right? The other one is a situational ethic, and, and this is all leading up to something that we need to talk about. This ethic is very problematic. Okay, because the situation determines the ethic, right? Now, it is useful because it's the classic self defense plea, right? Somebody comes into my home and uh, they get a knife and says, I'm going to kill you and kill everybody in your family. I'm going to take everything here. And I have a knife and I say, No, you're not. And I kill the person. Uh, you know, it's wrong to kill, but I saved my family. The situation demanded. Uh, that I protect my family. Okay. That's the classic self-defense plea. When you go, you know, Hey, he was going to kill me. It was him or me. The situation demanded that I take his life in order to save mine. That's the classic self-defense plea, right? So it is used all the time, but it can be very problematic because uh, many follow this ethic to, to evil consequences. You know, it's whatever situation demands, well, you know, I got to do this in this situation and may not be right. And, and if you follow this ethic as your primary ethic without any principle, it's really bad, you know, um, because, uh, you know, if you could be, you know, uh, in a situation where, you know, uh, you just get yourself in dangerous situations all the time instead of you, instead of uh, being principled, you know, and doing what's right. Uh, so it's a very problematic ethic. If the situation is right, I can do whatever I want with this ethic. I can do whatever I want if the situation demands it. I can go whatever I want to do whatever I want to hurt whoever I want to hurt. As long as I get what I want, you know, because uh, it's, it's my thing. Um, the context of the de of the day determines right and wrong and not the principle, right? Um, we've seen this ethic destroy the America we once knew. I'll get into that. This ethic is, is quite in use today. Uh, it's the my truth, your truth ethic. I have my truth. You have your truth. I have my truth. You have your truth. Well, no, uh, that's not quite right. Mike, Micah's ethic was in line with the context of this world at the time, by the way. Um, same kind of ethic, and uh, it's in Judges 17, 6. In those days, there was no king, out of, king of in, in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. This is exactly the situation ethic. This is exactly my truth is my truth, and your truth is your truth, right? Uh, and uh, truth is fluid. It, it's whatever I think is truth one day. You know, I wake up a new, the next day I have a new truth, you know, it's my new truth, you know, and, and it's, uh, it's just fluid. It makes no sense that truth is either truth or it's not truth. And this is what's going on today. Now notice in judges, because there was no king in Israel, people did what they want in their own and what they wanted, what was right in their own eyes. Well, today people have removed King Jesus and what have they done? Everything that's right in their own eyes. So today people have and I'll rephrase this scripture, right? Today, people have uh, refused King Jesus because they want to do what's right in their own eyes. And this is what we're dealing. The notion of individual truth eviscerates any real knowledge of the truth. 
John 8, 31 to 32, John chapter 8, verses 31 to 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So there's a the truth, not many truths. There's a the truth, the one truth. Jesus is the truth. Hallelujah. Indeed, and an individual truth cannot free an individual. You can't be set free by your own little individual truth. It's actually binding you and actually preventing you, or preventing people from finding the real truth because they feel they have another truth entirely, right? And it's just a mishmash. So making God the number one priority, that's the principle. That's the principle we never let go of. Okay, God is my number one. That's my principle. That's where I stand. I have a principle ethic, and God is the head of it. Hallelujah. Everything we will do will flow from that priority. Everything we do, our thinking, our acting, our way of life, whatever we pursue, uh, as far as family and church and work and pleasure. If God is number one, everything flows from that priority. Praise God, right? Our family will be blessed by our commitment to the Lord. Uh, Indeed, our work will be more fulfilling because of our commitment to the Lord. Our relationships will be better because of our commitment to the Lord. And Jesus said in John 14, 16, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So once we have Jesus as this as our truth, our truth is Jesus. Hallelujah. He said he's the truth. There is no, there's no individual truth. There's only Jesus. He is the truth. Praise God. And when we follow after Jesus, everything else that flows from that make, making that our priority. The truth of Jesus Christ as Lord God, as God manifest in the flesh, as our Savior, as our King, you know, as our guide, as our counselor, as our wonderful, as our everlasting Father, as our Prince of Peace, right? All those things flow from that, and uh, he becomes the number one, hallelujah, because he's at the top of our priority list. Everything that flows from that will be blessed, family, work, relationships, finances, everything is blessed because of that. Hallelujah. And I have a picture of a lovely couple here who have just gotten married, and I'm hoping that their priority is Jesus. They're going to keep Jesus in the middle of that marriage. Hallelujah. Too many marriages are breaking up because people don't have Jesus as a priority, right? Their priority is their feelings. The priority is, well, I'll stay with you as long as I love you. Well, anybody who's been married longer than a few years knows that love between love that 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 kind of romantic love fades um it doesn't go away it just begins to transform and become something deeper right and the the friendship and and the togetherness becomes a uh, just just better and better and you have to get through you know that moment um you know where the romance kind of flees out the window you can bring it back now and again but you know it's just that uh that human beings aren't you know, we can't possibly be on that high the whole time, you know, and we have to get, we have to get through. If we make Jesus our priority, well, no, I got to stay in this marriage. I, you know, I, I, I love my wife. I love my husband. I've got to stay here and let God bless it. And that brings so many blessings to follow. Hallelujah. Now, let me talk about Israel here a little bit. Israel lost much of the land that it had gained under Joshua because it messed up its priorities, not just Micah, but Israel itself had messed it up prior, its priorities. So they had gotten so much of the land. I have a picture here of how the Ammonites, Moabites, Midianites, uh, the Mesopotamians, and uh, the, the Canaanites all came down back into Israel after Joshua had gotten the whole thing because Israel forgot its priority of putting God first. You know, in the book of Judges, you see that they, they stopped to do whatever is right in their own eyes, and they completely lost track. That's what happens when we abandon the most of our priorities. The enemy comes in and takes territory from us, takes things away from us, because the, the enemy comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy. So, you know, he begins to come in and steal the things that, that God gave us because our priorities got shifted, um, like the sin of Manasseh, right? I have a picture here of a sacrifice to the god Moloch. Uh, and uh, sacrificing children, uh, not unlike what's going on with abortion today. It's the sacrificing of children for, you know, for the God of pleasure. 
and convenience. Um, you know, and just, I mean, even the back, those who sacrificed to Moloch, at least they did it because they thought God was going to bless them with plenty and rain and harvest. But, um, today it's just simply for carnal pleasure. Uh, the sin of Manasseh happens in second Kings 21, 10 to 15. And so the Lord said by his servants, the prophets, because Manasseh, Manasseh, king of Judah has committed these abominations and has done things more evil than all the Amorites did who were before him, and has made Judah also to sin with his idols. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing upon Jerusalem and Judah such disaster that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the measuring line of Samaria and the plumb line of the house of Ahab. And I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. And I will forsake the remnant of my heritage and give them into the hand of their enemies. And they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies because they have done what is evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came out of Egypt, even to this day. So Israel priorities had, had no dive so much. It was actually Judah at this point, you know, that a righteous king couldn't even write the ship because God had already ordained because, ordained because what Manasseh did, did this is what's going to happen. And, you know, Judah didn't think it was going to have to happen because Babylon came from the west across all the sand desert. They thought, no, no nobody can. There's no way to bring an army all the way from Babylon past the desert and get Jerusalem. But lo and behold, it was done, and Babylon came and destroyed Jerusalem and took everybody captive because of the sin of Manasseh, because the nation had turned away from its priorities. And that's that's what happens when we stop looking at God and putting God first and, and substitute another priority, things are going to go awry. Uh, Manasseh's sin did not only impact him or his, and his house, it impacted the whole of Judah. And when we follow the wrong priority, we then risk injury, not merely to ourselves, but to those around us. But to those around us, it's not a victimless crime when we lose our priorities. Sodom and Gomorrah's priorities, I have a picture of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and brimstone raining down upon the cities, right? And Jude 7 to 8, there's only one chapter in Jude. He said, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. Whew, sounds a whole lot like today, doesn't it? Indeed, Sodom and Gomorrah pri prioritized sexual immorality and the pursuit of of unnatural desire, right? The pursuit of unnatural desire. In Genesis chapter 19, verses 4 to 5, said, But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, and all the people to the last man surrounded the house, and they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Now, this is how degenerate the cities had become. Because they, number one, all these men are seeking to have relations, sexual relations with men, which God calls an abomination. And not only is that bad, these two men that happened to visit the home of Lot are angels. It was to the point where the Sodomites wanted to have relations with ungodly relations with angels. They even refused Lot's daughters. It just shows you, it shows us that here we've seen in the country, we ask what's going on and why is Sodom uh, being lifted up so much now, you know, with the pride flags everywhere. Well, what has happened is people have no King Jesus anymore. So what do they do? They cast off restraint. They don't have a principle. They don't follow an ethic. They don't, fo they don't have a priority. Their priorities cease to become the worship of God and, and the moral, morals that God sets forth in his principles, but their desire comes uh, just transfers to their own fleshly whims and what they want and the satisfaction of the flesh and, uh, you know, the pleasure of the moment. And that becomes their priority. That's really, now, what kind of priority is that? What kind of priority is that? That's, that is certainly not of God. 
You know, no one should live by the priority to satisfy their flesh over the worship of God. That's what the Bible teaches from cover to cover, right? So priorities are extremely important, extremely important, all right? Prioritizing sexual immorality often precedes the death of an entire nation. You know, we've seen a lot of nations and empires fall because sexual immorality became the order of the day. And I hope that this is not going to be the case for the United States of America because we have sent many, many missionaries out into the world. And if we should lose that primacy, uh, we'll be in real trouble and the gospel will be in real trouble. So um, my only thing is that, you know, in Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, they couldn't find five righteous people. And you can see that here because everyone in the Bible says in, in the Genesis, the scripture I read, Genesis 19.45, it said all the people to the last man surrounded the house. Everyone was wicked, right? And uh, we, do, we still have people who serve God and have made God priority in this nation. So I think the Lord hasn't destroyed this nation yet because of the righteous uh, that are here. Praise the Lord. We've got to win more righteous. Praise God. And so we wonder if we are looking at the soon destruction of the USA, though. Hmm. You know, are we getting ready to lose our... our uh, preeminence in the world. Now, that's not so good. You know, it's not so good. Because there's not a lot of freedom of religion outside of this state of this country. So we have lost so much decency because of losing priorities. If you have the PowerPoint presentation, I included a picture of this uh, singer, Sam, Sam Smith, who has a top hat with horns coming out. He's dressed like a demon. Uh, and he's uh, singing demonic lyrics, you know, mocking God, uh, mocking the Lord. And he's also a uh, considers himself a trans. Uh, and his videos now are filled with all sorts of filth. Uh, and this is this is lifted up, saints, as something good in this country by many, many people. We're in a dangerous position. Uh, the Lord is not going to let this kind of thing go on longer. But this is what happens when a nation ceases to make God its priority. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And when the nation turns against God, this is why it's so urgent for us to win souls. Because, you know, if the Lord is coming back, I mean, certainly we see this kind of thing, say, man, we've got to be in the last days with this stuff going on. Uh, then we really need to be attentive to what God wants us to do and try to win souls whenever we can. Try to teach Bible studies. Amen. Uh, indeed, Matthew six twenty two to 23, Jesus said, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy and your whole body will be full of light, but if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? How great is that darkness? Priorities are inevitable, by the way. You may say, well, I don't really have any priorities. Nothing number one in my life. Priorities are an inevitable part of life. We are going to have a priority. Might as well be God. There's going to be a priority in your life. No matter what you think, there is going to be a priority in your life. It's going to be one thing or another, right? You know, you're going to serve something. Either you're going to serve God, or you're going to serve the devil, you're going to serve your flesh, you're going to serve your boss, you're going to serve your career, you're going to serve money. So you're going to serve something. And something is going to become your God and your number one priority in life. And as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Indeed, either one will have a God-centered priority, a self-centered priority, or a Satan-centered priority. There's so many books out there about the self, being self-centered, self this and self that. You know, we have one book that's, that's uh, not self-centered, it's God-centered, called the Bible. Hallelujah. And that book is really the one we ought to read, you know? And the thing about the Bible is it just doesn't give us a glossed over view of humanity. It shows us the worst of humanity sometimes, but it shows us how blessed things can be when we make God our number one priority. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Indeed, all behaviors and all values that we have will flow from whatever our priority is. And you know, it's interesting 
that in this world we have to have such aggressive HR departments. And the reason for that is that we've lost the basic decency uh, that we used to live by. You know, the Bible gave us the golden rule, right? You know, do unto others as you have others do unto you, uh, which basically is a way of telling us to deal with people in kindness. But now we need lots of rules of how to deal with each other because people took away that priority. And so human beings try to create their morality and ends up being really crazy and convoluted. You know, you can't follow it. You know, uh, people get upset if you use the wrong pronoun. I mean, really? This is where we've come as a people that we have to use somebody's wacky pronouns, you know, and the reason is that, that and those pronouns, they, some, some of them they'll change day by day. Well, you use this pronouns today and the new pronouns tomorrow because I feel like a different person tomorrow. And it's just wacky because people have no centering. You know, they're, they're like, wa like waves of the sea tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, as the Bible says. You know, and so you want to get tossed by every wind of doctrine, then don't have, you know, then switch up your priorities all the time. But if your priority is Jesus Christ, he'll make your path straight. Praise God. Hallelujah. Indeed, if we choose anything but the light of the Lord, we will eventually succumb to the influence of our priority. Pull the curtain on that. Amen. We lose our way without the proper priority. I have a picture here of a riot where people are burning something, and that's what we've been seeing all over the world because people have forgotten God. And this is what we're looking at today, saints, with this kind of wickedness. Proverbs 29, 18. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18 said, Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. Blessed is he who keeps the law. Our priorities need to be absolutely on track in every way. And the prophetic vision, the vision that God gave us in the Bible through Jesus Christ is the thing that we need to heed at all times. Praise the name of the Lord.